In a burning village, a girl in Yakuta witnessed a rain of bombs drop from fighter planes. As people were fleeing for their lives, the girl and her mother were both running for safety. Unfortunately, the mother was crushed by debris. A person tries to summon somebody, turns out it was the little girl. The girl was later engulfed in flames while being transported to the other world. In the present, on a sunny day, Satoru Mikami looks back on his life on what he hadn't accomplished yet. All he hadn't done was try to get a girlfriend. Later, Satoru heard his name was being called by his junior at work, Temura. Temura introduces his new fiancé, Miho Sawatari, to Satoru. While the three was having a pleasant talk and was about to head to a nearby restaurant, Satoru was stabbed in the street by a random man with a knife. Luckily, Temura and Miho were safe because Satoru had pushed them to safety. While blood was pouring out from Satoru, a mysterious voice can be heard, granting him a body that doesn't require blood as well as various abilities like Predator, Great Sage, and various resistances. The voice can only be heard by Satoru, while the surrounding people couldn't hear the voice. Satoru Mikami requested his last wish to be fulfilled by Tamura, which was to destroy the contents of his hard drives. When Satoru awakens, he discovers that he has been turned into a slime. With nothing else to do while he comes to terms with his condition Mikami eats hippocute herbs and collects magic ore and eventually, after three months, settles into his great sage powers and gains an odd companion in the form of a voice in his head that explains various things about the things that Mikami comes into contact with. Eventually, Mikami accidentally launches himself into Veldora while learning how to swim. Veldora teaches the blind slime how to see using magic through which Mikami finally confirms that he indeed has been turned into a slime as well as learning the identity of his teacher, Veldora the Storm Dragon. 300 years ago, Veldora was trapped in the cave using the magic spell Unlimited Imprisonment by a hero, and now he only expects to live for another hundred years before his dwindling magical power finally kills him. According to Veldora, Mikami is a unique existence in the world. Yes, there are other people who have been brought to this world. Most of them have been summoned against their will and due to various complications die off quickly. Some like Mikami die and get reincarnated but usually, as the same species they were in their past life, a human and of those only Mikami has been reincarnated as a non-human, a slime. After some back and forth the slime and dragon agree to become friends. Mikami and Veldora discuss the idea of leaving the cave. While the slime is free to go anytime he wants, Veldora remains trapped. Towards that end, Mikami wants to use Predator to study the barrier and find a way of dismantling it using Great Sage. At a minimum, Mikami will contain Veldora's dwindling magic reserves and ensure that he doesn't fade away. Veldora agrees to the plan but before they continue he gives the slime the name Rimiru and asks the slime for a last name for both of them, Tempest. Once the newly christened Rimuru Tempest eats the dragon he learns, to his disappointment, that he can no longer communicate with him. At the same time, various monsters and governments sense the dragon's disappearance and begin moving to investigate and take advantage. Instead, Rimuru eventually finds the way out of Veldora's cave thanks to a trio of adventurers sent to investigate Veldora's prison. Over the next month, Rimuru hunts and eats a variety of different monsters and steals their abilities, learns how to swim and fire a water blade and continues to strip the cave of resources. Finally, Rimuru finds his way out of the cave and eventually comes into contact with a group of goblins. The goblins explain that after the disappearance of their guardian deity, Veldora, various monsters have started moving into the forest trying to stake their claim. Among them a group of direwolves have been attacking them. The goblins, weak in body and armed with poor equipment, stand no chance against the wolves that both outnumber and outgun them and so witnessing the great power of Rimuru Tempest's or request his help. Rimuru, thinking briefly on his past life and his inability to say no, agrees to help the goblins fend off the wolves. As the first step to helping the goblins fend off the Tempest wolves, Rimuru uses the Hippoch grass potions he's been creating to heal all of the injured goblins, bringing their fighting forces back up to the near peak. Secondly, he has the goblins dismantle their homes and build fences that he reinforces using the sticky and steel silks he got from the giant spider in the cave and builds traps using the nearly invisible thread. When the wolves arrive they get caught in Rimuru's silk traps and the goblins hit them with crude bows and arrows putting up an effective defense. The direwolf boss is undeterred and charges in, getting caught up in Rimuru's silk trap. Rimuru gives the boss one chance to turn back and run and when he refuses he decapitates him using water blade. With the matter of the enemy leader dead, Rimuru devours the former boss's corpse and takes on his form, giving the wolves the option of submission, retreating, or death. 
While it initially seems like the other wolves intend to keep fighting they ultimately submit to Rimuru. The next morning Rimuru, who realizes that he is now responsible for now not one but two groups of monsters, decides to take measures to make sure they get along. As a start, realizing that he has approximately the same number of goblins and wolves, he has them pair up and dub them goblin riders. The second issue, realizing that none of the other monsters there have names, decides to name each every one of them for the sake of his own convenience. In honor of the dead Rigger, his brother is also named Rigger while the chief is named Riggard with each individual glowing yellow briefly when named. When the time comes to name the wolves, in spite of the chief insisting that he breaks for a while, Rimuru simply takes his family name of Tempest and Wolf's racial name of Fang and dubs the new leader of the pack Ranga. Suddenly Rimuru's body collapses and enters low activity mode, the great sage informing him that he used up too much magical power. When Rimuru awakens he sees an unfamiliar young lady watching over his body. Rigard, now in a much bigger and much stronger body in the form of a hobgoblin, comes in and explains that they've evolved thanks to Rimuru naming them. Likewise, Ranga comes in and explains that because of the name Rimuru gave him they've evolved into Tempest Wolves causing Rimuru to realize he's made a new problem. Because the goblins and wolves are so much bigger their previous housing, feeding, and clothing methods are now non-viable. As a start Rimuru assigns the monsters into a group to hunt and gather food, thus averting one crisis for the time being. Although Rimuru was a project manager with a basic understanding of modern infrastructure in his past life and architect, he is not. Consulting with Rigard, Rimuru decides that he and a party of goblin riders will travel to Dwargan to barter for assistance from the dwarves living there. As Rimuru and his party consisting of five tempest wolves including Ranga and five goblins including Rigger and Gob to spend a few days traveling to the city of Dwargan, Rimuru questions the goblins on various topics. As a start, he asks Rigger about who named his brother Rigger. According to Rigger, his brother was named by a passing lieutenant in the Demon Lord's army, a fact that makes Rimuru mildly concerned. Rimuru also questions Ranga to determine if he's holding a grudge against him for the death of his father. For Ranga the subject of his father is not an issue. He holds no lingering feelings of loyalty compared to his gratitude for Rimuru sparing him and his pack's lives and naming them. Once the group arrives outside of Dwargan, Rimuru instructs most of the goblins and the wolves to stay back while he enters the lineup with Gopta. Once in the lineup, Rimuru and Gopta are quickly harassed by a group of adventurers who see them as weak monsters and wish to mug them. Having already instructed the goblins and wolves not to attack humans, unprovoked Rimuru instructs Gopta to plug his ears and turn around. Rimuru assumes the form of the newly evolved former wolf chief and uses intimidation to try to scare the adventurers off. Met with overwhelming success, Rimuru terrorizes the other people in the lineup and is immediately captured by Dwargan's guards. Fortunately, Rimuru's story lines up with eyewitness reports and since no one was hurt the guard captain, Kaidu feels inclined to let them go after a bare minimum amount of time. At that time one of the guards charge in and report that a group of miners have been injured in an attack by an Armorsaurus and they have no potions to heal them. Rimuru chimes in and trades in a large amount of his high-quality health potion in exchange for his freedom. Once the dwarfs are healed Kaidu agrees to take him to the best blacksmith that he knows. Kaidu takes Rimuru to his brother Kaijin who also turns out to be the boss of the three miners Rimuru healed. While the dwarf is grateful for the safe return of his employees he is already in the middle of an order for the kingdom. Kaijin has to make 20 magic swords for the kingdom and thanks to the work of a minister named Vesta he has no time and no magic ore to make them. Rimuru recalls his time in the cave and regurgitates refined ore in the form of a chunk of magisteel. He also requests the one magic sword that Kaijin has already produced. Predating the sword Rimuru instructs the great sage to manufacture 19 copies of the weapon made out of magic steel, and regurgitates them, thereby completing Kaijin's order for him. In exchange, Rimuru explains that he needs the use of an architect to build his village and a craftsman to make clothes and weapons for his people. Agreeing to Rimuru's terms, Kaijin takes him to a bar staffed entirely by elven women who weigh on the slime and four dwarfs hand and foot to celebrate. While still at the bar, one of the elves working there offers to read Rimuru's future in order to find the person who he is destined to meet. In the crystal ball, Rimuru is treated to a vision of a woman and five children leading Rimuru to wonder who they are. Around the same time a local minister, Vesta pipes up and questions Kaijin on what he's doing there when he should be trying to complete his order. However, Kaijin explains that he already sent in all twenty of the long swords he was made to complete, surprising the noble. 
deciding to quickly change the topic. Vesta comments that he's more concerned that a lowly slam has been let into such a high-class establishment and makes his displeasure known by dumping a mug full of alcohol on Rimuru. Kaijin, thoroughly enraged by Vesta's disrespectful behavior, punches him clean out. Though Rimuru is initially concerned that this will cause trouble for Kaijin and the bar Kaijin asks that Rimuru take him to his town to act as the artisan that Rimuru required. Unfortunately, Kaijin's brother Kaidu is forced to arrest the four dwarfs and one slime and keep them as a prisoner until their trial. Once inside of the prison again Rimuru realizes that he left Gopta tied up in the cell, who is still asleep. Rimuru wakes the sleeping goblin and informs him that if he wants out of his silky prison he will have to summon his tempest wolf and get himself out. Kaijin apologizes for his behavior and explains to Rimuru his history with Vesta. Originally, Kaijin was a captain of one of seven orders of royal knights under King Gazel Dwargo's command and Vesta was his aide. Unfortunately, one day one of Vesta's projects, the Magi Soldier Project, spectacularly malfunctioned as a result of Vesta's rush and Vesta pushed the blame on Kaijin who was forced to resign. Since then Vesta constantly makes unreasonable demands of the dwarf smith trying to get him into trouble. Despite that Kaijin insists that Vesta isn't a bad person at heart and believes that he might be better if Kaijin leaves, which is another reason why the dwarf wants to go work for Rimuru. Likewise, the three brothers intend to follow Kaijin under Rimuru's employment. The next day the five are called into court and quickly realize their trial has been rigged, since the five aren't allowed to speak unless spoken to their lawyer speaks instead who makes it quite clear that he has already drafted their confessions. Vesta meanwhile has dramatically exaggerated his injuries and collected eyewitness testimony stating that Kaijin and his accomplices attacked Vesta unprovoked while he was in the middle of a drink. Before the five can be sentenced however Gazel asks Kaijin if he ever intends to return to his employ, to which Kaijin says no. The four dwarfs and one slime are banished never to return to the city. Alone with Vesta, the king questions him on if there is anything he would like to say to him before he too is banished from the kingdom. Gazel reveals that he knew who really was responsible for the Magi soldier failure all along. But because of his high hopes for Vesta did not expose his lie but now his antics have gone too far. Gazel reveals the Hippoch grass potions that Rimuru created that is superior in ability to the ones that they can create. And now because of Vesta all of their ties have been cut off with that slime. Thus a teary-eyed Vesta is thanked for his service, before being led out of the court never to return. His dream of one day being of use to the king utterly shattered. The brothers Kaijin and Kaidu have a heartfelt farewell while the king looks on. He instructs an elven assassin to apprehend the lawyer before sending her to spy on Rimuru, acknowledging him as a threat on par with the missing Veldora. At the Kingdom of Blumen's Free Union HQ, Guildmaster Fuse debriefs three adventurers, Guido, Cavill, and Iren on the state of the surrounding area. Simply put, their intelligence combined with the trio's report has confirmed two things. The Eastern Empires are not moving on the surrounding areas, and the second is that Veldora has indeed disappeared from his prison. With this in mind, Fuse gives the trio three days off before he sends them off on another investigation into the Great Forest of Jura. While the three are complaining they are approached by another adventurer named Shizu who asks to go with them on their mission as the forest is on her way anyway. Meanwhile, Rimuru has returned to the goblin village to discover a change that has occurred while he was gone. 500 goblins have moved into the village seeking Rimuru's protection. After the great sage informs him that the goblins will be wiped out by other stronger monsters that are now moving on the village, the ogres, the orcs, and the lizardmen, he decides to take them in and name them. After exhausting all of his energy and entering low activity mode for three days again Rimuru awakens to discover his village further changed. Under Kaijin's instruction, the goblins are now learning how to make tools and weapons, while Garm has taught the goblins how to make proper clothing. Dord who is teaching them craftsmanship and Miad is guiding them and make buildings. With a dash of influence from Rimuru who lends his limited knowledge of the infrastructure of his homeworld. Gopta, who was forgotten about in Dwargan has freed himself by summoning his Tempest Wolf and returning to the village by themselves where they are now sharing their experiences. Rigard has been made the official king of the goblins with the former chiefs of the absorbed villages his goblin lords. Speaking of, Rigard comes in with a report about a group of humans who have gotten themselves into bind nearby. Cavill, Gaido, Iren, and Shizu are being chased by a horde of giant ants, several of which Shizu destroys with a magic sword and the last Rimuru dispatches with black lightning. Once they've introduced each other Rimuru realizes that Shizu is his destined one he's meant to meet according to the elven prophecy he received. 
getting a better look at Shizu's companions Rimuru learns that they are the same trio that he met on his way out of Veldora's cave. Rimuru breaks the tension using a slime joke he heard from a video game that elicits a laugh from Shizu. Once the adventurers explain why they are there Rimuru confirms that the Freedom Association shouldn't have any problem with them building a village there. Meeting with Shizu alone Rimuru confirms that she is from Japan and Shizu confirms the same as him. The pair share their stories of how they came to be there. Whereas Rimuru merely died and was reincarnated as a slime Shizu was summoned to this world by force on the tail end of the Second World War. The individual who summoned her pulled her out of the firebombing of Japan so to cheer her up Rimuru shows her images of the rebuilt Japan and of it being put back together. However, the mood is suddenly interrupted by some kind of painful injury on Shizu's part. While she seems fine Rimuru is called away to discuss the building of the village. Shizu meanwhile has a flashback of her summoning and of the man who did the deed leaving her body severely burned in the process. Deducing that she had an affinity for fire, Shizu's summoner forcibly bonded her to a fire spirit named Ifrit. One day, shortly after being summoned to the New World and bonded to Ifrit, Shizu and her summoner slash master are attacked by the great Majin Koenig. Deciding to treat the situation as an opportunity, Leon has his newly minted minion incinerate the Birdman. Satisfied Leon asks the girl her name and decides to name her Shizu. After Shizu's injuries have been treated she starts wandering around the nearby forest where she encounters a young girl named Perino who has befriended an orphan fox monster that Shizu names Pizu who grows bigger as a result. Deciding that the monster seemed friendly the two bring him back with them to Leon's castle as their pet. Unfortunately, Pizu becomes openly hostile to Leon and as a result, Ifrit takes over Shizu's body and incinerates both the monster and his owner leaving Shizu severely traumatized. Waking up from the nightmare the adult Shizu finds herself in the goblin village where Ifrit's aura is now acting up. Though Shizu likes the town her quest to track down her summoner lures her elsewhere. That said Rimuru states she's welcomed back at any time. On her way out of the village, Ifrit finally breaks free from Shizu's control and takes over her body and goes on a rampage. Rimuru orders the goblins to evacuate and confronts Shizu with Cavill's party, with the adventurers realizing that Shizu is really a veteran hero also known as the Conqueror of Flames. To combat his enemies Ifrit summons several salamanders to fight alongside him. Though Rimuru's water blade attack is initially ineffective against the fire spirits he mixes it with Eren's icicle lance attack to create the icicle shotgun for use against the monsters. Once the salamanders have been defeated Rimuru orders Ranga to take the adventurers away to safety. Confronting Ifrit alone Rimuru is initially caught in a trap when he's consumed in a circle flare by Ifrit. Although Rimuru initially freaks out, Great Sage reminds him that he has thermal fluctuation resistance which immunizes him against fire-based attacks. Instead, Rimuru uses Ifrit's own attack as a smokescreen to bind him in steel silk followed by swallowing him using Predator and separating him from Shizu. Once inside of Rimuru's stomach Ifrit is confronted by Veldora who laughs at Ifrit as he claims that he cannot defeat Rimuru. Rimuru is inside of Shizu's room waiting for her safe recovery. Shizu is depressed as she nearly killed her friends as Ifrit again. To cheer herself up, Shizu wants to tell her life story to Rimuru and he complies learning about the events that shaped her life after coming to the new world. One day, Shizu's master Leon Cromwell was finally chased from his castle and Shizu was left behind as the rear guard. When Ifrit realized that they couldn't defeat the hero its fear gave Shizu an opening to reclaim control over her body, and with the anti-magic mask the hero originally wore the influence of the fire spirit could be suppressed altogether. More important Shizu was able to use that fire power, hence how she became known as the conqueror of flames and thus became the companion and student of the hero. One day though the hero disappeared without warning or explanation. After a long career as a solo adventurer the influence of Ifrit began to assert himself, so to minimize her reliance on the dangerous power that would allow the fire spirit to rampage freely. Again Shizu retired and became a teacher in the kingdom of Ingracia where other world travelers learn about their abilities and the world they now live in. One of them even became the Grand Master of the Freedom Association. However Shizu has reached the end of her natural lifespan and Ifrit's will has overtaken hers, resulting in the rampage the day before. Hence Shizu's last quest, to find Leon and make him tell her the information she wants to know. While Shizu is glad she got to spend the last few days of her life with such good people she has a new request not for Rimuru, but for Satoru Mikami. Shizu wishes to die among the memories of her homeland so that she is not subjected to the cruel cycle of reincarnation of this world, and thus asks that the slime eat her as he had the cursed monster that had tormented her. 
Rimuru agrees and declares that he will find the man responsible for her fate and make him take responsibility for his actions. Inside of Rimuru, Shizu is reunited with the souls of her slain friends and her dead mother as her long hard life ends peacefully. Later, Cavill's party and Rigard arrive in Shizu's room to find what they realize is actually Rimuru in the form of a naked human, a slightly younger androgynous version of Shizu with blue hair and golden eyes. Giving the group an explanation as to what happened and proving he is who he states he is Rimuru transforms back into slime and apologizes to the group for his impromptu private burial. Before the three adventurers leave, they ask Rimuru to turn back into Shizu's form so that they can at least say farewell to their friend's image. Before the three adventurers leave though Rimuru has the dwarfs manufacture new and improved equipment for the three of them. The group in turn promises to give a positive review of the village and recommend non-interference with their affairs. In the meantime though, an orc is traveling through the desert and just when he collapses from exhaustion he is met with Jelmud who offers him meat and a name, Gelb. Despite the minor setback of Ifrit's attack, the goblin village continues to build and rebuild on schedule. While Rigard and his goblin lords have worked out the finer details of governing even without Rimuru giving anyone orders. This works out for Rimuru as he's been experimenting with his new abilities he got from eating Ifrit and Shizu. For starters, Rimuru has repaired Shizu's anti-magic mask that got damaged during the incident with Ifrit. Rimuru also confirms his human form works exactly like a normal human body. His senses are slightly dulled when compared to using magic sense though. As a makeshift mirror Rimuru spawns a clone and confirms his appearance in human form. Rimuru confirms that he looks like an androgynous Shizu, doesn't have any gender. His default size is due to the limited mass of his physical body. Furthermore, the black mist he occasionally produces is his magical power making up for the difference in mass and as needed he can alter his form to grow in age or switch between genders. Rimuru also confirms that his sense of taste has returned and thus orders Rigard to prepare a feast. On his way out of the village Rimuru also confirms that a huge number of magical beasts are moving through the forest, possibly due to a change in the environment, so they'll have plenty of meat for the future. Rimuru takes the liberty of training the more dangerous of his abilities inside of the sealed cave where he figures he won't hurt anyone. Shizu's unique skill to generate allows her to fuse together in separate skills to produce new skills as needed. One of Shizu's stronger creations is Black Flame, a skill that produces a highly destructive mass of black plasma thus is yet another skill that Rimuru has to be careful with. Rimuru also confirms the function of the anti-magic mask to suppress magical power, thus while wearing it he appears to be a completely normal human. However, before he can experiment further, Rimuru receives an emergency request for aid from Ranga via thought communication. Ranga's hunting party has come under attack by a group of six ogres. Most of the members of the party has been put to sleep by the ogres princess, and those who are still able to fight, Ranga, Rigor, and Gobda have only received minor injuries. Though Rimuru initially wants to settle the matter peacefully with the ogres, their leader will have none of it. By process of elimination, they have determined that Rimuru is the only one who could be responsible for the orc army that attacked their village. Their reason is based on account of the fact that he is in command of a group of monsters roughly as strong as the orcs. Rimuru commands Ranga to capture the ogre princess, while he focuses on dealing with the others. Rimuru incapacitates the hammer-wielding ogre using paralysis breath, the female warrior ogre by tying her up with sticky steel thread. He then deflects the other sword-wielding ogre with body armor and knocks him out with it while Ranga succeeds in capturing the priestess. The eldest among the ogres identifies each of the monsters the skills came from and in the process confirming him as the most dangerous among the ogres. Rimuru attempts another attempt at peace, tries to deduce who they have mistaken him for though the revelation of his abilities only serves to make them more suspicious. Unfortunately, the ogre elder takes the opportunity to sneak up on and try to kill Rimuru though he only succeeds in cutting off one of his arms. Instead, Rimuru demonstrates his high-speed regeneration and immunity towards fire-based attacks. Deciding to take things seriously, Rimuru removes his mask and produces a giant mass of black flame and black lightning. The ogre princess, however, gets between them and reveals the misunderstanding, as she has determined that Rimuru is not the leader of the orc army that attacked them. Had that individual used this much power, they would have no need to use orcs. She's also determined that the mask he is wearing is much different than the Majin who was leading the orc army, whereas Rimuru's mask seals his aura, the one the Majin was wearing didn't. Now that the ogres have calmed down, Rimuru reabsorbs his attack and reveals his true slime nature before leading both groups back to the village to determine who is responsible for the army of violent thugs that attacked the ogres' village. 
confirming that none of the ogres have names in the process. A crowd of tense hobgoblins have gathered around Rimuru who is taste-testing meat skewers that have been prepared for him. After careful consideration, Rimuru cheerfully declares the meat good, and is quite happy to have his sense of taste back. While the various hobgoblins, dwarves and ogres are enjoying themselves the ogre's young master has sat down with Rigard, Rimuru, and Kaijin as he explains what happened. Several days ago an army of fully armed and armored orcs attacked the ogre's village without provocation or warning. Though the 300 ogres living in that village were quite strong the sheer numbers of the enemy soldiers attacking them overwhelmed them. The ogres there are all that's left of them. One of the last things that the young master saw before fleeing with as many people as he could was a Majin wearing a clown's mask standing over his father's burning corpse. Since Rimuru's mask looked similar they concluded that they must have been working together, hence their misunderstanding. The most sensible conclusion is that the orcs have been given new power by a demon lord, why they don't know. Rimuru takes the liberty of noting that the ogres have settled into the village rather nicely which leads him to wonder what the ogres plan on doing now. Naturally, the young master's current greatest ambition is to find the leader of the orcs and kill him along with as many of his subordinates as possible. Realizing that the young master doesn't have a plan at all, Rimuru instead proposes that they become his subordinates in the mutual interest of fending off the army of orcs that are wandering around the forest destroying everything in sight. It is something that the ogres need to consider carefully, so the young master goes out to think. The next morning the ogres find their resolve and agree to become Rimuru's subordinates at least until they can hunt down and defeat the orc's leader. As is customary with his subordinates, Rimuru names each one of the ogres. The young master is now Beniamaru, his younger sister Shuna, the female ogre is Sheehan, the elderly ogre Hakuru, the other male is Sue, and finally, the hammer-wielding ogre is Kurube. Once the process is done, however, Rimuru passes out from overusing his magic again and wakes up days later to learn that the ogres have evolved into Kitchen and have since been keeping themselves busy inside of the village. Hakuru has taken to bullying groups of hobgoblins and calls it training them. Kurube has inserted himself into Kaijin's blacksmith team while Shuna and Shin have taken turns looking after Rimuru's unconscious body. The reason why naming six ogres took up so much of Rimuru's magic is because naming stronger monsters takes up vastly more magical power than the weak goblins. Beniamaru and Rimuru begin discussing strategy and dealing with their enemy. After having time to think about it Beniamaru wonders if the orcs are connected to another demon known as Jelmud, who visited their village offering to name the ogres claiming to be a lieutenant in the demon lord's army. Rimuru recognizes the name Jelmud as the one who also named Rigor and wonders if it's a coincidence. In the meantime, the orc army is making its way to the Lizardman village near Lake Sis. After determining the enemy outnumbers them two to one and that they've already crushed the stronger ogres the Lizardman chieftain, concludes that the enemy army is being led by a legendary monster known as a orc lord, who is said to devour the fear and hesitation of his subordinates making him a natural leader. Thus the chieftain calls his son Gaburu and assigns him the task of forming an alliance with the goblins in the interest of boosting their numbers. Unfortunately, while traveling to the goblin village on over lizards, Gaburu's subordinates boost the already overconfident Gaburu by commenting that with the name given to him by a demon lord's lieutenant, Jelmud, it's only fitting that he use this crisis as an opportunity to succeed his father as chieftain. The Kijin are hard at work in Rimuru's village. Shuna is showing the dwarfs and goblins her methods for weaving hell moth silk while Shion has inserted herself as Rimuru's personal bodyguard and secretary. She also attempts to become his chef too, but after Gobta gets food poison from her food, Rimuru assigns Beniamaru the role of her taste tester, on account that he and the other Kijin already knew she was a horrible chef. Meanwhile, Gaburu and his fellow lizardmen are progressing in their efforts to bring the goblin villages under their command. They note that the next one they are to visit has tamed direwolves under their command, his subordinates once again patting Gaburu's ego. The group travels to Rimuru's village and after making an ostentatious entrance for Gaburu, the lizardman ends up insulting Rimuru to his face in front of his subordinates trying to recruit Ranga's pack to fight the orcs. Diffusing the situation Ranga has got to fight Gaburu instead with Rimuru motivating him with the carrot stick combo of a weapon from Kirobe and more of Xion's cooking. The hobgoblin uses the spear he was given as a distraction, shadow motion to sneak up on Gaburu and finally, he knocks him out with a kick to the back of his head, causing his subordinates to take their leader and flee as quickly as possible. In spite of Gaburu's personality and him seeming too stupid to be a scared attitude making an alliance with the lizardmen isn't a bad idea. The orcs are in their territory and dealing with them there is preferable than waiting for them to strike. Rimuru also wonders that if the demon lord that's backing them is the same one who hurt Shizu. 
but while at a meeting with his subordinates a dryad named Trainee asks to join in, requesting that Rimuru subjugate the Orc Lord. The meeting between Rimuru and his subordinates and Trainee the Dryad continues. Sawe reports that he scouted the destroyed ogre village and has confirmed that both the ogre corpses and the orc corpses have completely disappeared. According to Trainee, the surviving orcs ate them. When an orc evolves into an orc lord they gain an ability called Starved, which works similarly but differently than Rimuru's Predator. For starters, when Rimuru consumes someone using Predator he has a 100% chance of gaining their abilities, but they apply only to himself. Compare Starving Ones, which although it has a much lower rate of success and drives the users mad with hunger instead triggers species-wide mutations, the orcs have already gained the ogre's brute strength. Currently they target the lizardmen's heightened speed, agility, and ability to walk on water. But the worst case scenario is when they will seek out the collection of strong monsters Rimuru has gathered together, not to mention the dryads and treants trainee has under her protection. With the powers of all the creatures of the Jira forest combined they will become an unstoppable plague on the world and will spread like a rapidly evolving swarm of locusts. As if further prodding Rimuru to action trainee also informs him that the orc's actions are being guided by a Majin named Jelmud who is working for a demon lord. Remembering the promise made to Shizu Rimuru agrees to wipe the orc lord. As a start, in order to even the numbers against the 200,000 strong orcs, Sawe is assigned to establish proper diplomatic relations with the Lizardman chieftain. In the meantime, Gaburu finally wakes up following his humiliating defeat by Gobta. He immediately comes to the conclusion that Gobta was the strongest fighter in the village and that they lied to him about being weak to throw him off. One of Jelmud's colleagues Laplace informs him about the impending attack on the Lizardman settlement and voices his concerns that Gaburu's father might be too weak to face them. Thus Gaburu makes the decision to take over the tribe now and lead his people to victory against the orcs. Meanwhile, Sawe arrives at the Lizardman village where he forces his way into the chief's chambers. With the orc army on their doorstep, Sawe instructs the chief to hunker down in a defensive battle until Rimuru's reinforcements arrive to deal with the orcs. After rescuing one of his guards from being decapitated by Sawe after he insults Rimuru the chief makes a few deductions. Sawe, originally an ogre and now a kijin after being named by Rimuru is a being of great power therefore Rimuru must be someone of even greater power to be the one who named him. If such a person with such subordinates came to their aid then the odds of survival and for that matter victory for the lizard men will rise dramatically. Four days later, midway through Rimuru's reinforcements arriving, Gaburu arrives and overthrows his father as chief. Gaburu proves himself a competent military leader waging several guerrilla battles against the orcs and thinning their numbers using hit, and run tactics. However, he is caught off guard by the terror of an army that devours its own dead. Hey everyone, I just wanted to give you a huge thanks for supporting me thus far. This was the recap of that time I got reincarnated as a slime episodes 1 to 12. I'll be uploading the second part soon. In the meantime please subscribe and hit the like button and comment your thoughts on the video. That would help me a lot. Also I've been working on my scripting skills so expect the future videos to be a lot better. Thank you for watching again, see you in my next video.